Okay, welcome everybody to this quick guide to online learning. Online learning may have the exact same material, but it's a very different experience with some advantages and disadvantages compared to in-class learning. So in this video, I'm gonna try and give you some information on what online learning will probably be like, and also give you some advice for what I have seen work best in my online classes. So to begin, let's look at the overall concept of online versus in-class learning. Let's start with in-class learning, and three big factors to the in-class learning environment are that it's live, supervised, and public, which means you're around other people. So generally, the teacher would present information on a board, maybe they would do some uh, experiments or examples, or ask you to read something in class. And for the most part, people felt compelled to do this. Might not do it all the time, but they knew that's what they were supposed to do, it's what most other people were doing, and the teacher was there to remind people to stay on task. Now switch to online. There's no teacher in the room, you have a lot more independent time for work, and even when you have those live class periods, it just doesn't still have the same feeling as a teacher in the room. This is what I would consider to be the biggest challenge of online learning, and that's struggling with motivation to do your work when there's not really that same external pressure of the classroom to get you to do your work. It's just you by yourself. So this is when I think students start, ha start having these thoughts, like, I just don't feel like doing this, or I feel super unmotivated. And I think what led a lot of people to think, I just hate online learning. But before you give up on your online course, let's take a look at some of the advantages that this platform gives you. The first one is even though it's not live, it is often recorded. This can be extremely beneficial because if you've ever just kind of gotten bored and dozed off during class and missed something that the teacher said, or you talk to your friend for a moment and miss some information, now you can go back, you can pause, you can rewind, you can go back and listen to all the things that was said during class in case you miss something. Also, if you've ever felt, oh, I didn't quite get all those notes down, or you felt you spent your entire class just trying to write as fast as you could, you can slow this down at your own pace. So having the information recorded can be a huge advantage. The second advantage is it has a bit more of a flexible schedule. There's probably some time you still have to attend for like live class periods, but the rest has some more flexibility. And that's because in class, the teacher has to operate at a speed that generally works for everyone pretty well. But in online, you get to use the time with what works best for you. So if you felt you need a little bit more time for notes, you have it. If you want to fly through an example and move to the next one, you can do that. You don't have the rest of the class either slowing you down or speeding you up. You get to adjust your time to what best works for you. Now, it's a good idea to still spend a whole class period on that material, but you can adjust what parts you're working on. And the third advantage that I have here is that it is not public. Now, this might not apply to everyone, but if you've ever been a student who's been a little bit nervous to ask a teacher to go back to the previous slide, or maybe you missed something because there were some other people distracting you, or maybe you had to ask a question, but you were nervous of what other kids were going to think, all of that gets removed. You work at your own pace, you're in your own workspace, and you can send questions through email to your teacher or have a Google Meet so not everyone has to see your questions. So hopefully that makes it a little bit more comfortable in this in learning environment for at least some of you. Okay, now that we have gone over the concept and the advantages and disadvantages to it, let's look at how to be successful in this online learning environment. Okay, so I'm gonna go through five key things to help you to be successful in online learning. And the first one is actually to shift your mindset. And what I mean by this is I think it's common for people to think that between the teacher and the student, the teacher is responsible for the student learning, giving them the information, getting them to learn it. However, this actually isn't the case. And if we can shift our mindset to understanding that it's actually the student's responsibility, this can help us a lot in online learning. Now, this does not mean that the teacher doesn't have to do anything. They still have a very big role, but their role is more to guide you, almost like a coach. And the reason for that is consider a hockey player and their coach. The coach is unable to train for the player, to work out for the player, to shoot for the player, and ultimately to score goals for the player. As much as they might want to go on the ice, they are not able to do that. Their role is to teach that player how to perform at their best. And that's what a teacher is doing in school as well. They can't just give you the answers. They can't write the tests because they can't 
learn something for you. The goal is to get the student to learn new information, which the teacher simply can't do for you. It's something they want to help you achieve on your own. And that little shift in mindset, I think putting the responsibility onto the student can really help with their motivation to go through the notes, to watch the videos, to study, and to ask the teacher for help or questions if they don't feel like they are actually learning the concepts. So that's a big one with the change in mindset that you are going into this course, you have to learn the material, you are responsible for your own grade, but fortunately you have a coach and a teacher who's gonna try to help you as much as possible through this journey. Okay, number two is note-taking. Now this is a bit of a difficult skill, but I think it's because the purpose of note-taking is often misunderstood. The purpose of taking notes is actually not to just write down material. That's what we have textbooks for, copies of the information. So just making another copy of a textbook isn't gonna get you anywhere. The purpose is actually to learn the material. That means make new neuron connections in your brain to understand a topic. And that's easier said than done. And how you do that is different for everyone, but I think it has two key components. And that's to interact with the information and to think. Interacting with the information basically just means reading whatever you're supposed to read, watching whatever you're supposed to watch, listening to whatever you're supposed to listen to. It's when you get exposed to new information. Now that's the easy part because just because you're exposed to information doesn't mean you're going to learn it. Another common misconception, just because you read something, see something, doesn't mean you're actually gonna learn it. The next part is key and you actually have to think about what that information is. And what I mean by think is asking some questions in your mind about the material to see if you understand it. Things like, does that concept make sense? Uh, what else would that concept apply to? What's the main idea and how does it work? A really good way to test to see if you understood it or if you just read it was, could I explain this information to someone else? And after seeing information the first time, the answer is probably going to be no. This doesn't quite make sense. I don't think I could explain it to someone else. And that's totally okay. So what you have to do next, take some effort. This is the learning process where you go back to that information, look for the key parts, go over the definitions, go over the concepts, think about what it will apply to, and keep interacting with this information until it makes sense. Examples can be really useful to go over here. And once you've done this enough to feel that you could explain to someone else this concept, then you're done. You have learned that material, which was the whole point of taking notes, and you haven't even taken any notes yet. So what's the point of writing things down? Well, this is basically to help you to remember what you've learned. So what I would recommend for taking notes is to write down an explanation of what you just learned, like you're trying to teach it to yourself in the most simple way possible. So what that means is if you wanna draw a picture, if you wanna write some point form notes, any way that you can explain this concept that makes sense to you, it doesn't have to make sense to anyone else, as long as this reminds you of what you learned and explains it in the way that you know it, you'll be able to use that small diagram, couple notes, bit of information to remember it for a test later. And that's the whole point of writing down these notes, solidifying your understanding in writing it out and having a piece of material afterwards you can reference that's gonna remind you of what you learned. Okay, so next what we're gonna do is try and give you an example of this process. It'll be kind of sped up, but hopefully it gives you the idea. Let's say that you have to learn about kinetic and potential energy and you have this paragraph in a textbook. And you're being a good student and you're going to write some notes on it. If you're new at writing notes, you might begin to start writing down all the information you can based off that paragraph. And although you're putting in some effort there, you've just really made a copy of what it has in the textbook. This isn't gonna be much easier to study and there's no learning required to copy these words. So I wouldn't recommend doing this as it's kind of a waste of time. Now, if you're a little bit more experienced, you might have shortened the information. You might be making point form notes like this where you read through the section and shorten it into some point form notes. And this is better. This is a shortened version. So if you go back to review your information, you have a little bit less to study. However, there's minimal learning required. You could make point form notes on something that you fully don't understand. There's a little bit more processing here, but it doesn't necessarily require learning. So remember that the key to learning and making useful notes is thinking and processing that information. So again, this is gonna be a bit sped up, but this is what I think that could look like. First, you read through the whole paragraph and think, okay, this is talking about kinetic and potential energy. Do I understand this? Well, I do remember that kinetic energy is the energy of movement. It says that the speed increases, the kinetic energy increases. I think about that, that makes sense. This seems to be uh, pretty easy to understand so far. 
It says it can be in planets, cars, atoms, baseball, sound waves, light. Okay, that seems to make some sense. So now I'm going to write some notes just explaining that simply. So I'm going to say, okay, we have energy is the topic. And we're talking about kinetic and potential. And so for kinetic, it said the big thing that that was based off is movement. And it said this could be from a baseball, <laughs> kind of a bad baseball, but a baseball there. Um, it could be from sound waves. So I'll put a little speaker here with sound waves uh, sending out uh, air vibrations. Could be even from a light bulb that has light waves traveling away from it. So anything moving, I'll put a little star there, anything and moving. That seems to sum up kinetic energy for me. Again, this is pretty short notes and I'll remember that when I go back to it. Now next, I could start writing notes down on the potential energy, but maybe that isn't making quite as much sense. So I need to go back and read it again and try and process through that. So it says potential energy is based off of position, but that's not really as easy to understand. So I got to keep reading. So next I see that it says a uh, position which can create motion. Okay, see so some kind of relation to the energy here with motion, uh, but it's talking about position, kind of the potential for motion. Okay, still kind of confusing, but it gives some examples. So a stretch spring is not moving, but it has potential energy stored in it, and it will be released when the spring is going to move. So now I'd kind of be visualizing that. Okay, a spring when it's stretched is not moving, but there's energy in it because if I let go, it's going to move. Okay, I can see how there's energy in a stretched spring. A similar example, it says if a mass is up high on a shelf, it's not moving, but it has the potential to fall. So in a position where it could move. Okay, that's making a little bit more sense. So now I'm going to write some more notes on that. And what made sense most for me was those examples. So I might write that here I have a stretched spring. And I would say this has energy. And I write a spring that is not stretched or in its natural position has no energy. And I might write different, different position. Right, different position for that stretch spring and potential energy is the energy of position. Similar if I had a mass on the ground and it's got no energy, if I put it into a different position up high there, it could fall or could move. Right? It's got the potential to move, so that has more energy. Okay, so again, it's kind of sped up, but in that example, I was trying to show how you have to think through the information, have it make sense before you write anything down. So in this case, the material was learned if you could explain it on a sheet of paper. Then writing down that explanation is going to help to solidify it in your brain. And also, you have a short explanation of what you learned for reviewing later for tests. Number three is practice. Once you've learned that material, you should apply this to some practice questions because this is what you're gonna have to do on assignment or test. Most courses will have some practice questions like this for you to try, but you might find that when you try them, you don't know how to do them. This is totally okay and totally normal. What I want you to do at this step is not to drop the pencil, give up and say, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm out, I just can't do it. Because if you do that, that's the exact same thought that you're gonna have on the test when a similar question comes up. And if you say, I don't know, I need the teacher to show me the answer, they show you the answer, you didn't really work through solving that problem, so you probably won't be able to do that on the test. So what I really want you to do when you go, I don't know how to do this question, is reference those notes that you just made. Think of, okay, what was the concept that I understand and how does that apply to this example? And then you try different things. Well, what if I do this, does that work? What if I do this, does that work? And have that experimental process so that you can work through this problem. You'll probably get to the answer through that process, but if not, then it's totally fine to ask your teacher and still that you've gone through that process will help you remember what worked and what didn't so you can do it correctly on a test. Number four is asking questions. I know I've talked about all the work that you have to put in with the notes and the trying the examples, which is all very good for your learning, but if you're struggling, please ask the teacher. That's what the teacher's there for. That's what they really want to do. They really want to help students understand something by giving them another explanation, another example, and trying to explain it in a way that makes sense. So please don't be embarrassed to ask. This happens to everyone in the learning process. Um, even if it's just a check understanding, meaning I think that this is what the concept is, but can you help me out? The teacher's gonna be very happy to help you with that. That's why we got into the profession. We like helping students to 
understand concepts. And the last one, number five, is to study. I know students don't like to do this. I don't like to do this when I have to prepare for something either, but it is fundamental for doing well on an exam. Now, the fortunate part is that if you've done all the other steps so far, this actually isn't too hard of a step and it won't take too long. Because if you've thought about and sorted through all these concepts and have some notes for you to remind yourself of what this learning was, you can go through this pretty quickly. The hard part is if you haven't actually done those steps before and you've never learned the concepts, you have to do a lot of work to learn this for the first time. So if that's the case, you basically just repeat all the steps we've already gone through. But if you've already done that, just go through your notes, think, okay, this topic, can I explain that one still? Yes or no? If no, go back to it. If yes, move on to the next one. Keep going through that process, go over your practice questions. If I get one like this on the test, could I do it? Again, yes or no. If no, go back and look over the examples and you can feel pretty confident after that process that you could answer anything on the test. And that's it. I know it was a little bit of a longer video, but hopefully that gives you some ideas for how to be successful in online learning. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one.